Welcome to Women in the Word. What a beautiful day to be here studying God's Word with all of you women. It's one of my favorite places on earth. You women amaze me every time I'm up here, and I just get to see how you dive into God's Word. It just makes my heart so happy. You know, um, I'm sure all of you can agree with me when I say that this study has flown by. I mean, I feel like it was just yesterday we were going, these names. Will we ever get through these names? Like, this is going to be hard. And here we are on the last day of our study. You know, when we started way back in 1 Kings 1, we first saw David. That's who he started with. And he was nearing the end of his life. And he was getting ready to follow God's command to name his son Solomon and crown him as the next king of Israel. And on his deathbed, David gave Solomon some final instructions. I put those on your verse sheet because I think those are really important. He says, I'm about to go the way of all the earth. Be strong and show yourself a man and keep the charge of the Lord your God, walking in his ways, keeping his statutes, his commandments, his rules, and his testimonies. And it is written in the law of Moses that you may prosper in all that you do wherever you turn. And we've heard those words over and over and over, not just in this chapter, but leading up to this. You know, when I was here last, David had just died, and Solomon was sitting on the throne. It had been firmly established by God. And, and as soon as he got on that throne, he started ensuring that they would live at peace. The whole nation of Israel would be at peace. And he dealt with those four guys that his dad had warned him about on his deathbed. And he was about 20 years old when he took that throne. And I think the gravity of the responsibility he felt at that young age and all that responsibility, it led him to pray that a beautiful prayer to God, he prayed for wisdom and discernment. And wasn't God gracious to answer him? He did it. He didn't just give him wisdom and discernment. He gave him wealth and honor and all the other things that go with it. And then about after that, he jumps right into starting to build that temple. The temple his dad had envisioned for years. King David envisioned this temple. It was going to be amazing. And he started out. It took him about 10 years to do it. He, t- he took three years just to get the supplies gathered together. And he spent seven more years building the temple. And I think it was during that time we really got to see that wisdom and discernment put to good use, didn't we? He designed the workforce Everything, how he organized and orchestrated all of that was amazing. And over the next 20 years, after he finished that, he built palaces. He built other buildings and fortresses. And then he took and made all the pieces that were going to go into the temple. All those altars and the lampstands and all of that stuff. Now, in chapter 28, he was going to bring the, I'm sorry, chapter 8, he brings the last thing of importance into into the temple. It was the Ark of the Covenant, and it was going to go into the Holy of Holies, and it was a huge spectacle for all of Israel. They were celebrating this moment that God was finally going to dwell right there with them in Jerusalem. And he he prayed this beautiful prayer of dedication. He instructed the Israelites with something we've all heard a zillion times studying 1 Kings. To let their hearts be wholly true to the Lord, walk in God's ways, obeying all of his commands. And then he offered all of those sacrifices. Remember, like thousands of offerings and sacrifices. And following that celebration, God appeared to Solomon again. Not the first time, the second time. He appeared to him and he gave him the same warning he had given before. Walk in my commandments, walk in my statutes, obey my commands. The last two chapters leading up to where we are today are spent recording the wealth and the power and the notoriety that was acquired by Solomon, but very little bit about God. When I was here last, I encourage you to begin reading between the lines as you continued your study of 1 Kings. I actually want you to start doing, I want you, when you leave here, maybe over the weekend, read 1 Kings again up to chapter 11. It's going to get, you're going to have totally new eyes now that you've read the end of the story and you know how things turn out. But I wanted you to not only see the splendor and the greatness of, of Solomon and all, all during his reign, but I also wanted you to use discernment. And I wanted you to read between the lines and start looking for those little things that maybe aren't recorded or are, but subtly in there that you start to see that something was off here and there. He was not always obeying. 
And if you did, then I'm positive you were able to see that there were areas, areas in, in his life where it started to reveal a divided and disobedient heart, a heart that had been left unguarded by the very man who wrote Proverbs 4. I put it on your verse sheet. Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flows the springs of life. Solomon wrote that, and I, just, I saw very little of him guarding his heart. And we begin to see, when you read between the lines, you begin to see those cracks that are revealed in his obedience and his commitment to the Lord. If you haven't already done so, I want you to open up your Bibles to 1 Kings 11. I'm just going to start off by reading the first eight verses. Now, King Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women, from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, you shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. He had 700 wives who were princesses and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For when Solomon was old, his wife turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of Sidonians, and Malcolm, the abomination of the Ammonites. So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not wholly follow the Lord as David his father had done. Then Solomon built a high place for Shemeth, the abomination of Moab, and Melech, the abomination of the Ammonites." on the mountain east of Jerusalem. And so he did for all his foreign wives who made offerings and sacrificed their gods. So I think at this point, if you're wondering at all about Solomon's reign, how it's going at this point, I think it's pretty obvious. The heading alone gives you a not so subtle hint. The heading says Solomon turns from the Lord. Um, If you're wondering at all how he turned from the Lord, you only have to read the next few verses to learn all about Solomon's sin. Verse 1 says, King Solomon, now King Solomon loved many foreign women. According to verse 3, he not only loved many foreign women, he married many foreign women. He married 700 foreign women to be exact, and he also had 300 concubines. I mean, seriously, what could go wrong? (laughs) He has a house full of princesses, okay? (laughs) Our house has one, and it, it goes wrong all the time. Way back in Deuteronomy, God strictly commanded them not to intermarry with the women surrounding, in the surrounding nations. And then he said to not have many wives. Well, he intermarried with lots of foreign nations, and he married many wives. I think 700 would be many wives. He blew it. And I don't think he just woke up that morning in the beginning of chapter 11, and now he loves 700 women. 700 foreign women. I know, how do I know that? Well, I didn't wake up this morning loving all those shoes in my closet. My love of shoes started way back when, years ago. I love shoes. He loved foreign women. <laughs> and his love for those foreign women started way back in 1 Kings 3. It was, it was subtle in, in that chapter. But the first verses of 1 Kings 3 gives us a little glimpse of what I like to call rationalized compromise, and it reveals the beginnings of a disobedient and divided heart. I want you to look at that on your verse sheet. Listen to this. Solomon made a marriage alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt. He took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David until he had finished building his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. The people were sacrificing at high places, however, because no house had yet been built for the name of the Lord. Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of David his father, only he sacrificed and made offerings at the high places. That is filled with red flags, ladies. Kind of subtle, not so subtle, and some just glaring red banners. The first one I saw in there, Solomon says Solomon made a marriage alliance with the, with the Pharaoh, the Pharaoh of Egypt. Like, if you spin that a different way, it would sound something like Solomon rationalized his marriage to foreign women. It was clearly against God's commands. Then it says that people were sacrificing at the high places because there was no place for them to worship in Jerusalem. Another way to say that would be they were worshiping other gods and idols because it was just too hard to worship their one true God. 
And lastly, it says Solomon loved the Lord. He walked in his ways and his statutes. He, I mean, only he made sacrifices to other gods in, places, in, the, high, in the high places. You know, it didn't sound so bad, does it? It's not that terrible until you know that those high places with these elevated pieces of, of land were they dedicated to idol worship. It was evil in God's eyes. That wasn't just a red flag. That was a red banner. It should have been flying over them. They should have recognized this. I mean, I mean, I can only imagine what it sounded like. Well, you know, he does so much good. He's such a good guy. He, he's built so many beautiful buildings and palaces, and he's done so much. He's got our economy looking so good. We're living in the lap of luxury. I mean, he's just, he's just worshiping a few idols. What could go wrong here? At the opening of 1 Kings 11, 30 years later, his disobedient marriage to that one woman from Egypt ended in marriage to 700 foreign women. And did you notice the other subtle difference? Back in 1 Kings 3, included, it was included that Solomon loved the Lord. He just loved the Lord. And here in these verses, what do we read? He loved many foreign women. And the other, other thing we read is they, he clung to those, these women in love. It just seems like Solomon's love for the Lord had been replaced by the love for his many wives. His heart was divided now. That well-rationalized compromise way back in chapter three led Solomon to a full-blown disobedient and divided heart. And not only did he marry all those foreign women, he also built them altars up in these high places so they could worship all their gods and their idols. And guess what? He worshiped right alongside them. It was just like the Lord said it would happen if they did what he did. It seems like the Lord may know something, doesn't he? He has those commands for a reason. You know, way back when we read about Solomon dealing with those men that were disloyal to the throne in chapter two, I often thought while I was reading that, it was interesting that Solomon spent so much time and energy on securing his throne and securing his kingdom and, and that they would live at peace and very little time dealing with his own worst enemy, himself. The wounds we see inflicted right here in, in 1 Kings 11 are self-afflicted wounds and wounds that not only affected Solomon, they will end up affecting the nation of Israel for years and years to come. The last couple of chapters leading up to 1 Kings 11, where we learned that Solomon was flying high this guy was living his best life, wasn't he? He was loved, he was respected, he had wealth, he had power. He was, all the surrounding nations looked to him for his wisdom and, and apparently he had a house full of princesses. He was living his best life. I think all the other kings and all the other kingdoms were looking at this guy saying, that dude's got it going on. His kingdoms are gonna last thousands of years. His kingdom will never end but it seems like it might. Let's continue. Let's pick up in verse nine and continue. And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord and the God of Israel who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he did not keep what the Lord commanded. Therefore, the Lord said to Solomon, since this has been your practice and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes that I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and give it to your servant. Yet for the sake of David, your father, I will not do it in your days, but tear it out of your hand of your son. However, I will not tear away all the kingdom, but I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of David, my servant, and for the sake of Jerusalem that I have chosen. Now, I don't know about you, but I hope I never hear those words said about me. I hope to never hear the Lord was angry with Benita because her heart had turned away from the Lord. I never want to hear those. That is terrifying to think about. God responded to Solomon's pattern of unrepentant sin with righteous anger. Righteous anger. And my first response, I was reading this, I'm like, seriously, Solomon? You had everything. What, what were you thinking? He made it clear to you. He, he appeared to you twice to tell you what you should and shouldn't do. And boy, was I quickly reminded... I do the same thing. I do the same thing when I open up his word and I read the words he's written to me 
and words that instruct me and guide me and tell me all the commands and, and the statutes I should be following, all the things I should be doing, and yet I struggle with patterns of sin just like Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived. I struggle with partial obedience, and I learn, I've learned how to rationalize my compromise. Every little compromise, it seeps into my life. And God was outraged by Solomon's divided and disobedient heart. He told Solomon that because of his sin, he was going to split the nation of Israel. He was going to divide it up. Because of David's faithfulness, though, God would wait until Solomon's death to do that. And because of, also because of David's faithfulness, he said, I'm only going to tear away 10 of the tribes. I'll leave one, the line of David, intact. That one tribe would be the line of Judah. And it would become this reduced nation. Kind of, it would form a reduced-sized nation. So Solomon's sin would not annul God's covenant with his father, David. That would remain in, in place. God's plan was not going to be thwarted by Solomon's sin. And what follows in these next several verses that we aren't going to read for the sake of time is um, it's, it's the conditional part of the covenant God made with David. Let's look at some of that in 2 Samuel. Let's look at 2 Samuel 7 on your verse sheet. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. He's talking about Solomon here. And I will establish a throne of his kingdom forever. I will be like a father, like to him a father, and he should be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men and the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before you. Why would God raise up adversaries against one of his own children? Because he said he would. It's exactly what he said he was going to do. And why did he do it? He, because he loves Solomon with a steadfast love so strong, he's willing to discipline Solomon whenever he needs it. And he definitely needed it. Now, like I said, we're not going to read all of those verses about the first two adversaries. Um, I'll just kind of run over them. What's recorded are two, there were three actually adversaries that were raised up because of his disobedience. Two of them were external they were outside adversaries, outside the nation of Israel. And one was an internal right there inside the nation of Israel. Now, the first one, the first external adversary raised up, was named Hadad. He was uh, from Edom. Back in 2 Samuel, David and Joab, remember Joab, the leader of his army, had gone into Edom, and they had this great victory over Edom, and they pretty much wiped out the male population, but apparently not all of them because one young boy named Hadad escaped to safety in Egypt. And now we flash forward to present day and he's a man. And he's learned that David and Joab are dead and he sees this is the perfect opportunity to go stir up some trouble with Israel. And he does so in the south part of in the southern border of Israel. Now the second adversary raised up by God, his name was Razan. And back also in 2 Samuel, David had uh, attacked the Syrians in Zobah. And Razon was this young man at the time, and he managed to escape from there without harm, and he fled to Damascus. And while there, apparently he was impressive enough, they made him the king of Damascus, shockingly enough. And now he has the power behind him, and he says, this is the perfect time to take up some, to get back at at Israel, and he goes to the northern border, and that's where he starts to give them problems. And now we get to the third adversary raised up, um, and they would have this adversary, the internal one, would have the biggest impact on the nation of Israel. So I do want to read this one. I'm going to pick up in verse 26. Jo uh, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, an Ephraimite of Zeradah, a servant of Solomon, whose mother's name was Zeruah, a widow also lifted up his hand against the king. And, when, and this was the reason why he lifted up his hand against the king. Solomon built the millow, closed up by the breached city of David, his father. The man Jeroboam was very able, and when Solomon saw that the young man was industrious, he gave him charge over all the forced labor of the house of Joseph. And at that time, when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem, the prophet Ahijah, the Shilonite, found him on the road. 
Now Ahijah had dressed himself in a new garment, and the two of them were alone in the open country. Then Ahijah laid down, laid hold of the new garment that was on him and tore it into 12 pieces. And he said to Jeroboam, take for yourself 10 pieces, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. Behold, am I about to tear the kingdom from the hand of Solomon and will give you 10 tribes. But he shall have one tribe for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, the city that I have chosen out of all my tribes of Israel. Because they have forsaken me and worshiped Ashtoreth, the goddess of Sidonians, and Shemoth, the goddess of Moab, and Milcom, the god of the Ammonites. And they had not walked in my ways, doing what is right in my sight, and keeping my statutes and my rules, as David his father did. Nevertheless, I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand, but I will take, make him ruler all the days of his life for the sake of David my servant, whom I chose, who kept my commandments and my statutes." But I will take the kingdom out of his son's hand and give it to you, ten tribes. Yet to his son I will give one, that David my servant may always have a lamp stand, a lamp before me in Jerusalem, the city where I have chosen. And I will take you and I will reign over all that your soul desires, and you will be king over Israel. And if you will listen to all that I command and walk in my ways and do what is right in my eyes, by keeping my statutes and my commandments as David my servant did, I will be with you and will build you a sure house as I built for David and I will give Israel to you. And I will afflict the offspring of David because of this, but not forever. So, not only was Solomon facing adversaries in the north and the south, he had one adversary right under his own nose, right there in Jerusalem, it was Jeroboam. Now Jeroboam was a servant of Solomon's he was from Ephraim. Ephraim is one of the largest, most influential tribes in the, north, in the northern part of Israel. And Jeroboam was apparently a very able, very intelligent young man. And of course, Solomon, being wise, would have noted that. And he placed him in charge of all the forced labor. Do you remember we talked about the forced labor? Back when he built the temple, he organized the forced labor. And it was a very organized way to do it. Well, by this time, I think the Israelites were getting a little weary of all the building projects. And he built a lot. And I don't think they were quite as excited about all those forced, that forced labor that had been put into place. And it kind of started to create these conditions right for a rebellion right there in Israel. And all they needed was a leader. And there he was, Jeroboam. God raised up Jeroboam. Now, one day he meets a prophet out on, outside of Jerusalem and he, and who tells him that God is going to tear 10 tribes away from Solomon and they would go to him. And he was doing it because of Solomon's disobedient and divided heart. But because of King David, who was a man after God's own heart, he would not take, it, it would not take place until Solomon's death. And then Rehoboam would take the throne and he would be given 10 tribes to, to Jeroboam and one tribe would go to Rehoboam. And that one tribe would be Judah. Now, I know all of you math nerds out there are going, wait a minute. There are, 10, 12, there are 12 tribes of Israel, right? 10 are going here, one is going here. Even my little math brain can figure out something's wrong here. Well, as it turns out, at the time, Judah was a bigger tribe that they, you know, stayed Judah. Well, they combined with Benjamin, which is a small tribe. And so whenever they said Judah, they automatically, collectively, were talking about Judah and Benjamin together. And that's what's happening here. They're talking about the two of them coming together, and they're being called Judah. And the prophet ends by warning Jeroboam that this is because of God's grace that this has happened to you. It's not anything you've done, and, and you're going to have your soul's desire. But you better listen to what God says, follow his commands, or you're going to end up just like Solomon being disciplined by God. David's line, though, is going to stay intact, and the Messiah will still come out of that. And I think that's a marvelous thing that God did for David. Now, I want to stop just a moment and address this, because this bugged me early on. Um, it caused me to spend a little more time on it. Actually, it ended up being what I think is our biggest takeaway from our study of, David, of King Solomon. Uh, over and over, we hear, because of King David... Because he, was, he, he followed my can, commands. He followed my statutes. He was a man after God's own heart. He was an amazing king. But I'll tell you what, that guy got some things wrong a time or two, didn't he? Yeah, he made a mess of things quite a, 
at least two times that we know of, and there were some others. Messes like an affair, and then arranging to have a man killed in battle, and then a couple other times, he just went totally against what God told him to do and did what he wanted to do. On the surface, I thought, that doesn't sound any different than Solomon. What makes David different than Solomon? Because I think we need to know that. Because at any moment, I can be Solomon, and I want to be David. See, the difference is, David, when he had his affair, and Bathsheba and, with Bathsheba and her husband was killed in battle, David arranged that, God sent Nathan, who was an advisor of David's, to David, and stopped him dead in his tracks, and showed him, made him realize that he had sinned. He told him, you, he made him recognize and acknowledge he had sinned. And, and look at 2 Samuel, let's see how David responds to that. Nathan says, why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. And David said to Nathan, this is big right here, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also will put away your sin. You shall not die. Ladies, we all need a couple Nathans in our life, don't we? I probably need 15 or 20 we all need that person that's so willing to just step up and say the hard thing that we don't want to have to hear, but the hard thing would help us stop in our tracks and realize what we're doing is sin, and we'd recognize it, and we can repent. And, and I love David's immediate response. It wasn't one of, well, you know, I, I would have not done that, but I was, he didn't rationalize anything. He didn't put the blame on anybody else. What did he say? I have sinned against the Lord. He knew that he had not only sinned against all these other people around him, most importantly, he had sinned against the Lord. And God forgave David. And he removed that sin as far as the east is from the west. And now when God remembers David, he remembers him as one who obeys his statutes and his commands. I think David knew something that Solomon had let to, had yet to learn, and I think we all need to take that away from Solomon's, the study of Solomon. Look at 1 John 1, 9 on your verse sheet. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all our unrighteousness. See, God's discipline in 1 Kings 11, it was meant to stop Solomon dead in his tracks and help him recognize he was on the wrong path and then turn back to the Lord and repent. And don't confuse discipline with condemnation. They're not the same. God disciplines his children. He doesn't condemn us. Look at Romans 8.1 on your verse sheet. There is therefore no, no condemnation for those who are in Christ. See, when we place our trust in the redemptive work of Christ Jesus, we become a part of God's family. And you, you know this, you start having a hunger for God's word. You wanna study God's word and you wanna take the things you're learning and apply it to your life and adjust your life according to his word. And, and God's discipline is a part of that process. It's a process that's known as sanctification. And he disciplines us because he loves us. Hebrews 12, 6 says on our verse sheet, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son and daughter he receives. He is a good father. He is a great father. He wants his very best for his children and he's willing to discipline them for it. He knows that the best for us is to be purified from our sin and grow in his faith and our dependence on him. He loves us way, way too much to leave us in our sin. And that's what he wanted for Solomon. His discipline is meant to stop us in our tracks, help us to recognize and acknowledge our sin, repent, and turn back to him. Let's finish up. I'm just going to read the last four verses. Solomon sought, therefore, to kill Jeroboam, but Jeroboam arose and fled into the Egypt to Shishak, the king of Egypt, and was in Egypt until the death of Solomon. Now the rest of the acts of Solomon and all that he did and all his wisdom, are they not written in the book of the acts of Solomon? And at the time that Solomon reigned in Jerusalem, where all of Israel was 40 years, and Solomon slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David, his father, and Rehoboam, his son, reigned in his place. Solomon's response wasn't exactly what I would hoped it would be. 
I don't think exactly what God wanted it to be. Unlike King David, Solomon refused to acknowledge his sin and repent. Now, whether he did it later in life or before he died, I don't know that. It's not recorded here. But I do find it interesting that the very one who broke Proverbs 3 missed the point of God's discipline so badly. Look at Proverbs 3 in the verse sheet. It says, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof, for the Lord reproves him who he loves as a father of the son in whom he delights. He had misplaced anger. He sought to kill Jeroboam. He had anger towards Jeroboam and not towards his own sin. He completely missed the point of this discipline and that misplaced anger just took over his heart, it looks like, and it began to fill in where they used to be filled to the brim with God's love. I, I really have zero doubt that if Solomon had stopped and acknowledged his sin, that it was against the Lord and he would repent of that and turn back to the Lord, this story would have ended completely different. But after reigning over 40 years, or for 40 years, King Solomon died and Rehoboam took over the throne. And we're left with nothing here about a change of heart or repentance of his sin. But I think 1 Kings 12 gives us a few hints about what the future looks like. You can drop your eyes down in, the, in that scripture. And the first heading of chapter 12 is Rehoboam's folly. It's Rehoboam's foolishness. It doesn't make me think he's going to do much better than his dad. The next one, next heading we see in chapter 12 says the kingdom divided. I think it happens. Unless you think, good old Jeroboam, he was intelligent, enough for Solomon to get it figured out, to figure that out. Unless you think he's going to get it right, well, the heading at the end says Jeroboam's golden calves. Spoiler alert. <laughs> Nothing good comes from golden calves. That never ends well. Don't get any. It's not a good thing. Now, Solomon's divided and disobedient heart not only affected him, it is left a wake of suffering throughout the nation of Israel. Their only hope now was that Jesus, it was Jesus who would come in the line of David that, that God had graciously spared. Solomon was 60 years old when he died, and, in my, and for me and biblical times, that was young. I think it's really young to die. Deb, Deb Haygood and I were discussing this the other day. We both had this little mini revelation and we were talking about Solomon's reign and how he reigned in peace. Like he was, his reign was known for its peace and it was known for all the things, that unimaginable wealth and power and notoriety and, and he never had to fight battles and, and it was just, that was not a pleasure left unattended during his reign. And he died at 60. His father, King David, a man after God's own heart, was a warrior king. He led his military into battle after battle after battle. I can't even imagine how David's body was beat up by the time he died, and he lived to be 70, a little over 70, like 10 years longer than his son who lived in the lap of luxury. You know, we began the study with Solomon's glory, and we're ending it at his funeral, basically. We were standing at his graveside, what would we say about him? You know, he had some really great traits, honestly. I, I think his eulogy would be, you know, he was a wise and discerning king. We could say he built beautiful, the beautiful temple that was just dripping with gold. He built palaces and fortresses and, and he, he grew the economy of Israel and, and the trade for Israel. It was amazing, his reign was amazing. And I think he offered up some amazingly beautiful prayers. But I think we could also see he had some flaws. He had some flaws like 700 foreign wives. Kind of a big one. Next really big one is he enabled and committed gross idolatry, which led to the disaster of the nation of Israel. I read a quote, it was by Paul House, a biblical scholar who wrote a commentary on First and Second Kings, and he said this about Solomon. He said, at worst then, this leader of Israel acts no better than the most foolish of his subjects. He thereby serves as a warning to those who take their God-given gifts for granted, or worse, come to believe they have achieved greatness on their own. See, Solomon is living proof to all of us in this room that a gifted mind is no substitute for an obedient heart. Not at all. 
You know, back in July, I um, had walked outside to do a little um, something in the backyard, get some other freezer or something, and something scurried in front of me across the patio, and it went into a flower bed. And so I, I don't like things that scurry, I can tell you that. It's always something I don't want to encounter, but I thought I needed to see that I didn't want it in my house or my garage, and so I went to the flower bed, and I found this little blue jay, little baby blue jay in the, in the, in the flower bed, and I got him a little thing of water because he looked pretty rough, and um, got him settled there for a minute, and I started to look around trying to figure out how he got here, but I could hear other birds, so I walked around the yard, and I found the nest of baby blue jays. Now, he's not the little bald one. He's got his, his wings and his feathers. They're not well established yet, but I figured out it was about a 30-foot high nest, and he had either fallen or, I don't know, maybe his mom started his flight school a little early, and kicked him out of the nest and it didn't go so well, but he was, it was July, it's hot. And he's hop, hopping across the patio. And so I, I thought I gotta get him back to his nest. I felt so responsible for the guy. And so I went over and I put my hand down thinking this is so stupid, he's just gonna run off and I'm gonna feel like I've got to chase him. And so I put my hand down and he turned around and he jumped right in my hand. And he just clung to my hand with his little claws. And I thought, well, okay. So I walked him over and I pried him off on the limb as high as I could reach him. And he hopped up all the way. And I watched him go all up to the safety of his nest again. He was safe and sound. Next day, <laughs> I open the back door and the dogs go racing out to go to the bathroom and they are losing their minds because something's floating in the pool. You got it, bluey. Little Bluey was in the deep end of the pool. His beak was up about, you know, it's barely, he's just barely moving like this. And I don't know how long he'd been in there. And I'm like, oh, great. So I threw my phone. I looked like a lifeguard, like I was a lifeguard in college. I throw my phone down. I'm kicking my shoes off. And I'm about to go in. And I realized that little guy is swimming to me. Like he is coming over to me. So I laid down on the side of the pool. And I reached as far out as I could. And he, again, his little, he's just barely making, he gets on my hand, he hangs onto my hand. I'm like, oh my goodness, and I'm trying to dry him off a little, and I take him back, and I put him on the limb. This time it took him a while, he was worn out. I don't know how long he'd been saving his own life, I don't know. But he finally gets up there, I didn't have to catch him or anything, so it's about two weeks later, I'm coming back from my morning walk, and about two houses down from me, I see something out crossing the street, hopping. And I knew it, I just knew it, it was Bluey. <laughs> he had now managed to get over an eight foot fence and I'm glad I didn't witness it, his flight skills are pathetic. <laughs> but he had crossed my yard and now he's out in the middle of the street hopping across the street. So I go out there and I think he's surely good enough by now, it's been two weeks and he'll fly off. I put my hand down, he turned around, he got back in my hand. I walked him through the house, because I knew his flight skills, I could get him if he got out of the house. <laughs> I go out to the backyard and I put him up in the tree and he goes right back up to his nest, right back to the safety of his nest. You know, Bluey was driving me crazy. I was regretting that I had ever met the, cat, the guy. I felt very responsible for him, but I also wondered, what does his mom do all day? <laughs> I mean, the nest is this big. And he's constantly getting out of the nest. But I started thinking about Bluey and I thought, you know, Bluey had a tiny little bird brain, but he had a little piece of wisdom that Solomon didn't seem to have at the time. See, Bluey knew enough that when he fell out of the safety of his nest, he only had to turn to the one who could get him back up to the safety of his nest. Solomon had left the safety of his nest he only needed to turn to the very one who knew how to take him and return him safely to that spot within his nest, within God's will. And he didn't do it. How do we avoid being that at the end of our lives? How do we avoid the same thing being said about us as is said about Solomon at the end of his life? Well, first you search God's word just like you do right now to know what you're being, when you're being tempted. Know that that's a temptation and, and obey his commands. Obey those commands completely. Secondly, remember that when we have fallen from the nest and he disciplines us, it's because he loves us. 
He wants his very best for us. Don't, don't allow his discipline to push you further away from him. Allow his discipline to, to bring you back to him, to draw you back to him. And when you find yourself outside the safety of God's will, just with complete confidence, know that you can turn back to him and repent. And he will remove that sin from you as far as the east is from the west. You know, in closing, I want to share a, a saying commonly used by Jewish rabbis. It was shared with me by Kristen Hoff, one of our Roman in the Word teachers. And I thought it was sums up what our takeaway should be uh, of our time spent studying King Solomon. It's very simple, but they say this. If you want to be wiser than King Solomon, obey. Think about that, ladies. Do you want to be wiser than the wisest man in the world? Obey God. That's how you do it. I honestly couldn't have said it any better. Please pray with me. Father, we want to be women that turn to you when we've fallen from the nest. Father, that we would be always learning your word, always studying your word, and we would be in your word and allowing you to guide us that we don't walk out of your will, Father. And when we do, I pray that we turn to you quick. Father, we love your word. We love your truth. And I pray that we don't leave here the same that we, as we came in, that we're different. Father, there's, your truths are planting in our heart, growing in fertile soil. We love you. We love your son. It's his great name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Vanita. If you've ever wanted to, to